and uh, E. Wallace, nice <laughs> night for dinner. Chad Satan. Thank you. I'm going to keep it a little shorter. All right, Ray? Uh, I just want to say it is an absolute honor. Words can't express how humble I am to be here and, and to be with this group here. Uh, I want to thank Ed Brophy and, and all those involved in putting this wonderful event together. I want to thank all of you for coming out here and showing your support. This is truly an honor. It's my first time here in, in Canastota, and I, I definitely want to come back and, and just experience it some more. You are wonderful, and the passion that you have to come out here and show your support means so much. So I know it means so much to them. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. All right. start our induction process, we're going to go over the deceased that uh, have been inducted this year first, and I'll be helped by Angelo. He turned pro in 1966 and compiled a record of 25 wins, two losses, and one draw before winning the WBA Flyweight Championship in 1970. He successfully defended that title five times over the next three years. His untimely death came in 1973 from injuries suffered in an automobile accident. <clears throat> Only 23 at the time of his passing, his death made national headlines, and to this day, he is revered throughout Japan. 2015 inductee in the old timer category, Maseo Oba. He learned to box in the Navy and turned pro in 1931, managed by Hall of Fame trainer Chris Dundee and fought the best of his era. He won the NBA New York's 160 pound belt in 1940. He retired in 1944 with a record of 135 wins, just 19 losses, 9 draws, and two, no contests, and 23 KOs. 2015 Hall of Fame inductee in the old timer category, Ken Overland. Born in New York, New York in 1914, he succeeded Hall of Famer and publicist Murray Goodman in Madison Square Garden's publicity director in the late 50s. He rose to vice president and ultimately president of Madison Square Garden Boxing in 1981. The creative force behind clever public relations promotions involving Hall of Famers Muhammad Ali, Nino Benvenuti, Bob Foster, Joe Frazier, Carlos Ortiz, among countless others. He was awarded the James J. Walker Award in 1968 and both the Jane Taub Award and the James J. Farley Award in 1984. 2015 Hall of Fame inductee, the non participant category, John F.X. Condon. And now we're going to uh, present a couple certificates here for some of the, uh, couple of the deceased. They have representatives. And first, I'd like to call on Sam Rose, and he's going to accept the certificate for John F.X. professional boxing. Only a few are memorialized for their achievements in the International Boxing Hall of Fame. Inductees of the International Boxing Hall of Fame in Canastota, New York, are determined by the criteria of the Hall of Fame and the vote of the Boxing Writers Association of America and other boxing writers and historians throughout the world. Congratulations on the high regard in which you've been held by this knowledgeable group. This honor symbolizes and the accomplishments in the sport of boxing, a worldwide year-round sport that requires discipline, dedication, and talent for the success you have attained. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Don. Thank you. What a great honor for me to be here representing John Condon, the Condon family, and Madison Square Garden, and to be part of this great ceremony with these great champions and Hall of Famers. Madison Square Garden will forever be known as the Mecca of Boxing. It's what grew the sport people to it, the great boxers, the great people around the sport, and the great fights that were promoted there, the great boxers who fought there. John Condon will forever be known as maybe the leading publicist of all time 
for his great work on the promotion of the greatest fight of all time, Ali Frazier won at the Garden in 1971. Those two greats fought in the ring that stands behind me inside of the Hall of Fame here. You can go in, take pictures with the ring, touch the ring. It is the iconic ring of all time. I got to work with John Condon for four years. When I signed the Madison Square Garden in 1982, my first assignment was to work alongside the president of boxing of Madison Square Garden, an icon at the Garden and a lover of boxing like no other person. It became clear how much he loved the sport, but above all, he loved the boxers. And it started with his kids' gloves program in New York City. I can still remember the ring outside of Central Park on 59th Street, Saturday mornings, with all the nine and 10 year olds there boxing with some hope of the future to get better, for a better future, maybe even to go on and turn pros. He was someone who helped many boxers in their careers, Riddick Bowe among them, Buddy McGurk, Mark Breland, and I can go on and on with the names. What I long remember is the golden gloves that we worked together and the big fight, the championship night of Golden Gloves in New York City in 1984. Over 15,000 people in the main arena and all these amateur boxers there. And John knew every single boxer and wished them well. And we went on the air at 7 p.m. and finished at 1 a.m. doing over 25 bouts. And he had as much energy at the end as he had at the beginning. He just loved boxing, loved to be around those young fighters. So I want to congratulate all of the Hall of Fame inductees up here. Again, it's a proud moment for me to be amongst the Hall of Famers. And I know for all of you, John Condit is up there smiling down and saying and writing great things about you all. You deserve it. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to call on Nomo Ikasima, uh, I hope, did I get it right? <laughs> to come up and say a few words uh, on behalf of Maceo Hopa. Hello. On behalf of the Oba family, uh, Mr. Honda, Ms. Nagano of Taking Promotions. We'd like to thank Ed and everyone at the uh, Boxing International Hall of Fame for this honor. Uh, we are very grateful that our champion has been remembered and recognized in such a way. And uh, thank you very much. All right. And now, our Hall of Famers that are present today. Born in 1955 in Japan, a son of a fisherman, he quickly developed as an amateur boxer, winning the All Japan High School Championship. He turned pro in 1974, and over the next two years, he scored eight wins before challenging Juan Antonio Guzman for the WBA light flyweight title in 1976, winning a seventh round KO that began a remarkable four and a half year reign. Retired at the age of 25 with a pro record of 23 wins and just one defeat, 15 KOs, still involved in boxing as a trainer, manager, and promoter. It is Busakan, uh, Yoko Busakan, the fierce eagle, and I'd like to also call on uh, uh, his spokesman, and that would be uh, Nabu Ikasuima.
I want to share. Thank you to everyone. <laughs> I had a great time in Kastana Total. <laughs> I will never forget this wonderful day. Publications and eventually wrote for a noted sports newspaper, Esto. At age 28, he worked as a matchmaker, arranging bouts three nights a week in Mexico's Arena Coliseo and Arena Mexico. He returned, he returned to Esto and he relocated to New York as a boxing correspondent and covered major fights around the world. As a manager booking agent, he is one of the most respected in the sport. He has advised 26 world champions. Throughout his 50-year career, he has worked with many leading promoters, including Bob Arum and Oscar De La Hoya. 2015 Hall of Fame inductee in the non-participant category, Rafael Mendoza. Or 26 world champions. 
Five of them are here in the Hall of Fame. Pipino Cuevas, Miguel Canto, Alexis Arguello, Chiquita Gonzalez, and Daniel Zaragoza, among others. This is for my mother, who is waiting, still alive, waiting for the photos of this event. And for my father, a great man and a great sports fan. My brothers, Roger and Fito, and my sisters, Rita and Teddy. I never signed a contract with my fighters in my life. It just was a handshake and that's it. The only contract that I signed was with a beautiful lady who <laughs> is right there. <laughs> my trainer, manager and advisor for the last 50 years. And, and the mother of my beautiful daughters, Macarena and Mariana. He gave me, he gave me Patricio and Carolina, my grandsons that they, they made me every 12 months grandfather of the year. <laughs> I also want to thank all my friends who made the trip to Canastota, especially the Cleto Reyes family, the Savara family, and another friends that will be a long list to mention. Finally, I want to make and a special dedication to a great friend of mine, a boxing promoter who was my partner, who co-promoted with him, with me. He has been in a tough fight, not for 12 rounds, but for more than 12 years. He had a problem, and he is still fighting. I know that he will never quit. My love to my I'm to Born in Norfolk, Virginia, his interest in boxing was inspired by his father, who he spent time watching Gillette Cavalcade of Sports. He started in boxing in the early 70s as a timekeeper, judge, and referee for the Police Athletic League. Worked as an, as an inspector for boxing in Atlantic City, and then in 1984 he began his career as a professional referee there, and two years later he officiated his first world title bout, an IBF flyweight bout in South Korea. He has since become one of the most respected and in-demand referees in the sport. In over three decades, he has been the third man in the ring for nearly 200 title bouts and has officiated all over the world. 2015 Hall of Fame inductee in the non-participant category, Double S, C. Steve Stoker. behind every great referee, and I say that with humility because on this stage, 
are some of the real great ones that I've had the pleasure of sharing the ring and learning from. It's a great family, and there they are. Tricia, Samantha, and Aunt Peggy. When you have a fight family, so this is a fight family. If I'm home more than two weeks, Tony and Benji, my wife says, what's the matter? Do they take the job, get on the phone, work the phone, and get your buns out and earn a living? It's enough already. You pay the mortgage, everything's done, get out. I said, yes, ma'am. That's fine. A um, couple items I want to uh, clear up. People ask me, where did the term, the double S, come in? When I saw Sammy today, he said, hey, not Steve, double S. That came from the Tropicana Hotel in 1982. When Ed Durian, he's up there, a lot of the, I'm going to refer to a lot of people who are looking down. And Ed Durian said to me, he says, I gave a catchphrase to this other referee from Philly, and I call him, and may he rest in peace. And uh, I worked with him extensively. Uh, Frankie Cap, he said, I called him Frankie Cappuccino, like the coffee, and I'm going to find something for you. Stevie Smoker. Double S, it's stuck. It's only been 34 years, it's stuck. Um, my uh, topic today is called Destiny, or Stevie, you've been in the right place at the right time. I graduate from law school, as Donnie indicated, by the way, I've worked with everybody on this stage, so I know them on a first name basis. I graduate from law school, I return to my hometown of Atlantic City, join the police athletic league, and truly get involved. I boxed on an amateur level very, very sparingly. I was wonderful. If I could punch Kenny Bayless, I'm ahead of the game. If he hits me back, I want to be a referee. <laughs> so that's how it happened, legitimately. So there wasn't too much action pre-casino. 1978, Russell Peltz gives me a pass to come across the Walwood and Bridge. And I go across the Walwood and Bridge, and I'm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I end up at the Cambria with Frank Cappuccino and Vic Cappuccino, both upstairs. And I worked with them to try to begin honing my craft. I had a very special day with a very special man. And that man was Zach Clayton. Zach Clayton, I think he did the thriller. Well, Larry, what did he do, Larry? Rumble in the jungle. Rumble in the jungle. And I had two days with him, and he said, train with music. You want to be rhythmic in the ring. You don't want to interfere. You want to be seen and not heard. So movement came. I took from who I thought were the greats to try to hone my craft. So. As time and luck would have it, right place, right time, casino gaming comes to Atlantic <coughs> City. And literally, the day after gaming, the fight community of Philly and New York comes to Atlantic City, and the first professional shows of that era begin in Resorts International. It was the only game in town. And one afternoon, I'm at the PAL, Police Athletic League, at that time, in 1980, I was appointed the district attorney of the city of Atlantic City. There were no beepers, uh, there were no cell phones, and the mayor of our city said, if you complete your docket by 2.30, as long as you're on a city extension to respond to the judges, it's okay. So yours truly would leave City Hall. There was a city extension at the PAL Center. So I would go there, get in the ring, and actually set bail in the ring while working, but I'm still on the city clock, city time. Sometime in late 78, 79, the phone rings at the PAL Center, and there was a phone connection. It was an old firehouse, and we used to go up this winding staircase to the gym. Phone rings, I pick up the phone. PAL Center, Steve speaking. Uh, can I help you? He says, is there anybody there that knows anything about boxing? I said, well, sir, I think I know a little bit about boxing. Can I be of some service? He says, true story. This is Jersey Joe Walcott, commissioner of the state of New Jersey. 
We have a pro card at resorts. We're short inspectors. Can anyone come over and help us out watching, wrapping hands and such and so forth? I said, you're speaking to the right guy, sir. May I, uh, what time is report time? He said in an hour, be in the front of Resorts International. That was it, the beginning. So I'm no dummy, I don't think, okay, right, I'm smart, right, Kenny? Anyway, I get there and I know that a leading hand wrapper trainer, another one in heaven, is Eddie Aliano, one of the best. The old timers would know. And I hook on to Eddie, who had just bought a summer residence in our area, and I said, help me with this hand wrap stuff. You know? <laughs> and we get through it. And they issue me an inspector's license, and then I'm still refing on the amateur level in the Philly area because we're not, it's not too busy in South Jersey. As the beat goes on, as we say, it starts to pick up and we get a lot of pro boxing in the 80s. And in Atlantic City in the 80s, if you are a developing referee and you want to hone your craft, you work almost every night. It was... Monday at the Tiger Eye with Stallone at uh, the Sands, Tuesday night at the Trop, Wednesday the Claridge, Thursday Playboy, and that went on into the mid-80s. I had an opportunity to meet every major boxing figure in the United States and some from foreign countries in Atlantic City during that time. It was a marvelous run. The 80s go. Get fortunate, early 90s, I'm doing a fight in Sardinia with Jimmy Birchfield, who's now a noted promoter in New England. And uh, we are running as I did with Benji in, where do we go, San Antonio, and at a convention, and Jimmy Birchfield, at the conclusion, was a hell of a fight, Kennedy McKinney, and Welcome to Cena. One of the greatest fights that nobody's ever seen. Google and look, you'll enjoy it. Be that as it may, Jimmy says, you know, there's a place coming up called Foxwoods by the Mashantucket Indians, and they're going to put together a staff. Would you come up from New Jersey? I said, sure, I come up from New Jersey. He said, they invited Frankie Cat, and they'd like to have you because they feel it's really going to take, take uh, off. And uh, they invite me up. And there's Foxwoods, right over there, a tent. I said, would you bring me up in the tent? He said, it's coming. Vinny Paz was the first major fight in the tent. Peter Manfredo would remember that. He was a youngster at the time. Well, you all know Foxwoods. The king of the 90s. So now, I'm appointed chief of officials of Foxwoods from 92 to 02. Major, major league. You name it. We had it at Foxwoods. It was absolutely fantastic. I had the opportunity to work all the New England fighters, including Vinny and Peter and uh, numerous, numerous fighters. I recall specifically, may he rest in peace again, Diego Corrales, fighters of that ilk. Zero, Jim, James Tony, Vasily Jira, fight of the year. We had Lennox Lewis up there. It was incredible. So now the 90s pour into 2000, and now through the efforts of John Burns, the commissioner of Foxwoods and Connecticut, also upstairs, he begins to allow multi-state licensure. Refereeing and licensure is very parochial. You have to be a resident of the state to be licensed in the state to work in the state. John Burns dispensed with that, and now New York opened its door, and in the late 90s, I received a call from Harry Albert. Harry Albert was assistant to Floyd Patterson, and also co-manager of Emil Griffin. And he took a position as the deputy commissioner of New York. And he invited me up to New York for New York licensure. Then came Pennsylvania. Then came Virginia. Then came South Carolina, then came Ohio, and by the grace of God, ladies and gentlemen, you are looking at the most licensed referee in the history of the sport of a boxing, as certified by Bernard Fernandez, the Green TV. 
So now we're into the 90s, late 90s, 2000s, 2000s, working the tri-state area with a lot of dear friends, several in attendance today. Great. And as Mr. Sam over here said, Mr. Rosen, if you can work the garden, then you work Trinidad Hopkins 2001. All right, you work that fight. And you feel the thrill of being in the ring in that particular fight. And you work Mosley Forest in that building with 25,000 people. So the thrill was immense. So now you reach the latter stages. We go to the, almost this era. In 2010, when, when I'm not on the ring, I'm a block from the mighty Atlantic. So yours truly is on the beach in September. And my cell phone rings. Don't yawn. Don't be bored, Miss Philippines. I'll be down soon. <laughs> Pay attention. I Pay attention when I'm talking. That's from my judicial days. I knew everything that everybody was doing. Because <laughs> I don't know if they had a shot in that. Right there, though? Okay. <laughs> be that as it may. Cell phone rings. I pick up the phone. Etienne Stange. I said, what? Beautiful day on the beach. Etienne Smoge. I said, What? I said, If that's Stevie Smoger, that's me. He said, My friend, Etienne is Steve. Smoge is Smoger. My name is JC Correge. I'm from Paris, France. And I am part of Eurosport. You know Eurosport? I said, Of course I know Eurosport. He says, We want to implement tournament boxing in Europe. And we need an American. Are you an American? I said, yes, I'll be anything you want me to be if you want to take me to Europe. He says, we do. We will F and F. I said, I have my wife's picture in the phone. Don't say F and F. He said, we will fly you. We will feed you. I said, okay, easy with that. F and F. He said, I can't guarantee purses, but you will see Europe. So that, that's, tw that's 2010 to the present. So it's been a marvelous ride. I, I cannot thank you all for allowing me, commissioners, officials, brother refs, brother judges, for allowing me to pursue my passion. It's been an absolutely tremendous, tremendous ride. I started thinking about other people. You don't think about this. You're too, you're too, uh, you don't want to be disappointed. So now, Brother Cortez opens the door. Then Brother Lane gets in. Then Brother Steele. So somebody says, listen, they're running out of Nevada. By, by process of elimination, maybe Eddie Brophy will take kindly on somebody from east of the Mississippi. So I said, well, you know, if you guys think that, they said, you're working well, Steve, you're staying active. And by the grace of God, it's happened. I can't thank you all. I'm, I'm thrilled. And I love my new ring. Darling, you cannot have this ring. This is my ring. God bless you. Jim Lampley, and to another, one of Philadelphia's finest writers, Nigel, Nigel Collins, congratulations. Nobody laid a glove on either of you, and for, for what you've done so well for so long. Thank you, Larry Murch. <laughs> Part of England, his passion for the sport of boxing began at a young age when his father and grandfather regaled him with stories of Bob Fitzsimmons, Joe Lewis, and Archie Moore. After immigrating to the United States, he boxed in the United States Army and eventually managed fighters turning, before turning his attention to writing. His professional career started in 1973 with Ring Magazine. He continued to freelance until 1983 when he joined the Ring staff as editor of Boxing Illustrated. 
After the ring retired Boxing Illustrated, he became editor-in-chief of Ring Magazine. In 2007, he was awarded the James J. Walker Award by the Boxing Writers Association of America. He's respected for his integrity and his knowledge of boxing history. He is currently with ESPN.com and Boxing News and his social media and content provider for ESPN 2's TV Fights, 2015 Hall of Fame inductee in the Observer category, Nigel Collins. Um, I think Steve took up all of my time, so I'm not going to say that. Yeah, um, obviously, i got to thank, thank a lot of people. I have a short list here because a lot of them are actually here. And, and some of them are actually Hall of Famers. Um, for instance, uh, Bert Sugar, who we all love, who's gone now. He gave me my first full-time job in boxing, so I'm never going to forget that. But I wouldn't have got that far if it wasn't for another Hall of Famer here, Russell Peltz. He talked Ring Magazine into hiring me, but he hated to do it because he lost a paying customer. <laughs> another Hall of Famer would help me, I believe he was inducted last year, was Graham Houston. He also helped my career early along. And you don't forget those people. Uh, like everybody, um, my life's had some ups and downs, and when I was down, there's two guys down there, Jeff Jowett, he used to loan me money, and there's Jack Obermar, he used to take me to the supermarket, all right. <laughs> when I became editor of Green Magazine, it was bankrupt, and it was very, very difficult to, uh, well, you couldn't pay many people, but... I was lucky, because it was ring, I could get some of the best writers in the world to work for me, sometimes for nothing, sometimes for a little bit of money. And some of them are here today. Uh, one of them is Eric Raskin, who's gone on to bigger and greater things. Bill Detlock, who just wrote the first biography of Ezra Charles. And Don Strasby, who I discovered out of nowhere, who could write anything. And, you know, there's a guy here who's real tall, he's in the back. He was the best art director I ever worked with. Stand up there. You don't have to stand up. Got it. Hey. Debbie Harrison, she's back there. She's, she's a sweetheart. That's what I can say. She's helped me immensely. Um, you know, none of this would be possible without the fighters. We'd all be unemployed. So, you know, those are the people that I owe the most to. Uh, they took the punches, they suffered the consequences, I just chronicled what they did. So, I feel that I'm in a different league, I can't even compare to any of those. But I, I do want to say something about boxing itself, not about myself. As you know, it gets a lot of criticism. It has good times, it has bad times. But there's something many people don't think about. Every one of you out there are a predator. All, all life is either prey or predators. Human beings are predators. That's why we survived as long as we did when other other species uh, died out. Now, in order to survive, we had to be tough, we had to be mean, and we had to do a lot of nasty stuff. But we needed a way to express that in more civilized times. And I believe that boxing is the most noble and wonderful way to express that silence. <laughs> yes, sometimes people get hurt, and you know, there's some tragedy in boxing. But think of how boxing is compared to war, where thousands and millions of people die. Boxing is a wonderful thing and it's never going to die until human nature changes and I don't see any sign of that. Thank you everybody, especially the whole thing. watching Sugar Ray Robinson on Gillette Cavalcade of Sports on Friday evenings. 
graduated from the University of North Carolina in 1971 and returned to Chapel Hill to earn a master's degree in communications in 1974. Hired by ABC as a sideline reporter on its college football broadcast at age 25. During his 12 years at ABC, he hosted wide world of sports and served as blow-by-blow -blow announcer for over 40 boxing matches, including Tyson Ferguson. <laughs> In 1988, he began calling boxing action for HBO as a blow-by-blow -blow announcer, and he's been at ringside ever since. During his career, he has covered a record 14 Olympic Games for United States Television and is a four-time Sports Emmy Award winner, 2015 Hall of Fame inductee in the Observer category, Jim Lampley. That might have been good. Um, thank you, Don Ackerman. Thanks very much. I'm going to keep this relatively brief, I hope, because I so strongly believe at this place and at this moment, everything should belong to the people who are courageous enough to step inside the ropes, both to entertain us and to teach us important lessons about life. Boxing is a canvas on which an endless stream of artists paint indelible images. I get the privilege of knowing them, and attempting to describe what they do. And just for example, I wouldn't be standing here today if it were not for the memories that Riddick Bowe and Prince Nassim Hamed provided. I might not have appealingly described them if I hadn't been watching and listening when Ray Mancini was delivering incomparable thrills before I began calling fights. So I'm specifically grateful to all of them for the chance to be here today, especially Riddick who's a dear old friend, and whose fights were always amazing drama on HBO. I'm also grateful to Nigel Collins, who's been a friend and a boxing mentor to me for 30 years, and to Steve Smoger, who has given me his perspectives on refereeing, and to Rafael Mendoza, who always made it a professional pleasure to deal with his fighters, especially Alexis Arguello, the greatest gentleman I ever met in the school. Don mentioned I was introduced to boxing at the age of six in 1955 by my mother in Hendersonville, North Carolina. My father had died of cancer the preceding year. In December of 1955, my mother took me to a Christmas party at a friend's home, marched me out of the living room down the hallway to a hostess's bedroom, turned on a black and white television set and told me, sit down, you're going to watch the Friday night fights, Sugar Ray Robinson versus Bobo Olson, this is what you and your father would be doing if he were still here. Don Dunphy called the fight. Robinson scored a knockout win. I was enthralled and immediately began familiarizing myself with Carmen Basilio, Gene Fulmer, Yama Bahama, Dick Tiger, Joey Giardello, Hurricane Carter, all the star television fighters of that great era. I watched all the Friday night fights for years. Then in 1960, I watched the Rome Olympics and I fell in love with Cassius Clay. All through the 1960s and into the 70s, boxing was my favorite sport. I went to junior high school and high school in Miami, and a couple of times my mother drove me 25 miles from our home out in the swamp to Miami Beach so that I could see the Fifth Street gym. I shook hands with Angelo Dundee, which makes me one of the biggest. And then in 1974, I won a talent hunt for a gimmick job standing on the sidelines of college football games with a microphone, and that launched my somewhat accidental network sportscasting career. I was working for ABC, which meant that a show called Wide World of Sports would afford me the chance to cover every conceivable sport, right up to wrist wrestling and barrel jumping, over the next decade. Every sport but one, anyway, and that one was boxing, because Howard Cosell called the fights. He worked alone, and it was his world, all his. Then in 1982, following the Larry Holmes Tex Cobb fight, Howard abdicated the microphone, and after a few years of examining other options, the ABC executives asked me if I would call the fights. It was a propitious moment for someone to make his mark at ringside. The network was getting involved with a spectacular 19-year-old heavyweight prospect from upstate New York. His name was Mike Tyson. 
I owe a lot to Mike. I called his first several exposures on ABC, along with a boxing freak named Alex Wallow, who took me to his apartment and taught me in a professional way how to see fights. And when Mike went to HBO, I eventually followed him there. I called his greatest victory, <clears throat> excuse me, the knockout of Michael Spinks. I called his most devastating loss to Buster Douglas. Mike has always been a generous and loyal friend to me. But the most enduring heavyweight in our business is HBO. And it's mostly because of the strength and intelligence of that network's commitment to boxing that I have this privilege. Because HBO has been so loyal and supportive to me, especially Richard Kleppler, Mike Lombardo, and the entire sports division staff, and quite a number of them are here today, and I'm deeply grateful for that. And because of that, you can scarcely name a prominent fighter in the past 30 years whose fights I wasn't lucky enough to call. Last year's induction class was a perfect example. Oscar De La Hoya, Felix Trinidad, Joe Calzacchi. I called all of their most important fights, with the sole exception of Calzacchi's win over Joe Lacey. I should give equal time to show time on that one. I've been helped and supported at ringside by, imagine this, Larry Merchant, George Foreman, Ray Leonard, Lennox Lewis, Roy Jones, Emmanuel Stewart, Andre Ward, Bernard Hopkins, and Max Keller. And every one of those men is either already enshrined here or someday will be. I have experienced a unique and incomparable assortment of thrills, and I look forward to many more. And please allow me a one-sentence campaign. Harold Letterman belongs here. Thank you, Celeste. Because of the indescribable devotion and willful effort of my amazing wife, Deborah, the entire Lampley clan with whom I grew up on the Blue Ridge have traveled to be here to share this with me today. That includes my cousin John and his wife, Claudia, cousin Pete and his wife, Cindy, cousin Bill and his girlfriend, Sharon, cousins Margie and Reed, most importantly, my 94 year old uncle, uncle excuse me, Dr. Bill Lampley and his wife, my very beloved aunt, Mary Ann. As we've mentioned, my father died a long time ago. My mom died in 1985, never heard me call a fight. Uh, but having Bill and Mary Ann here from Hendersonville is the living equivalent of having my mother and dad here. and three stepchildren who have endured the constant travel all these years, and Deborah's brother Dave, and niece Jennifer, and my dear friend John Bracken, who are all also here today. Thank you again, and all my love to you, Deborah Lampley. You are <laughs> incredible, quite incredible at being my wife. Trophies and the rest of the staff here for the whole weekend of hospitality, most of which I missed in service to Nicholas Walters and Felix Verdejo. One or the other of them, or both, might someday be here. And that's what it's all about. The people who have the courage to enter the ring. My eternal gratitude to all of them for bringing me here today. Thank you very much. As we're starting uh, the Hall of Famers in the Modern category, I'd like to uh, announce that the, the first of the Modern inductees of the class of 2015, Prince Hasim Ahmed, is unable to be here today to, due to an unfortunate medical illness concerning his wife, Alicia. <laughs> the Hall of Fame sends its thoughts and prayers for her full recovery, and I'm going to read his bio, even though he's not here to be introduced. Born in Sheffield, Yorkshire, 
uh, UK at age seven, his father brought him to Brendan Ingalls' gym to learn to defend himself. He turned pro in 1992 with a mesmerizing hand speed and devastating knockout power. Known for his flashy boxing style and thrilling ring entrances. He captured the EBU Bantamweight and WBC International Super Bantamweight titles in 1994 and began winning before winning the WBO featherweight belt from Steve Robinson in 1995. He also won the IBF featherweight title in 1997 and the WBC title in 1999. Let's give a hand to 2015 Hall of Fame inductee in the modern category, Prince Hassan. He compiled a record of 104 wins and just 18 losses in the amateur ranks that included a super heavyweight silver medal at the Seoul Olympic Games. Under the tutelage of Eddie Futch and wins over many contenders propelled him to the heavyweight title bout with undisputed champion Evander Holyfield in 1992. It was the fight of the year and he won a 12 round decision. He won that WBO title from Herbie. He won the WBO title from Herbie Hyde in 1995. He utilized a long and punishing jab, terrific punching power, and tremendous in-fighting ability to post a 43 victory, one loss, the 33 KO pro record. 2015 Hall of Fame inductee in the modern category, Big Daddy Rick Bowen. Thank you, thank you so much. You better say it. Well, look, I, don't, I ain't got to talk no more. I don't feel like talking. I got what I came for. Man. You know what? I haven't cried in, I guess, about 10 years. Bill. You made me cry, man. <laughs> made me cry, too. <laughs> it was a double knockout. Do you want to cry? No, I don't. <laughs> I love you, man. Bill, you all right. Well, let's, let's talk about it. I ain't going to be too long. I got my ring. <laughs> Baby, I got it. You see this? That's the wife, Terry, over there. Beautiful sister Thelma. You know how it is. I call him Bo Jack. Because he looks like it. And that's my daughter Mom. But anyway, I forgot how, I forgot what I was gonna say. You know, I got my I'm so happy. It's an honor to be here. And I thought about it there for 33 years. And I'm finally here. And guess what? I don't know what to say. <laughs> but what I will, what I, what I will say is that this is, I had a wonderful career. God is good. He's um, helped me when I needed a lot of help. You know, my wife, she, she's um, she's so wonderful. I couldn't marry a better person. Except when she gives me a hard time. <laughs> But you know what? It is so great seeing all, all the people that's involved with boxing. You know, um, J. Joe Martin. Yeah. Yeah. And the guy I used to watch when I was small. You know, crazy. Yeah. He never knew I watched him. This is my first time seeing him. He looked at me right up there, so I'm, I thought I might hit him with a hook. But But anyway, I've got a great work for we here that I already had it. Mills is not Mills is not that. Joe Cortez, he was, he was so great. And Holy Foot knocked me down. I swear to God, this is why I thought he said to me, he was counting. One, two, three. Keep your punk ass up. <laughs> so uh, I listened to him and I got up. <laughs> I'm not going to say.
right? <laughs> or maybe you want to believe me too hard. But I got up and I won the fight. So thank God for him. Well, if I fight again, he needs to be referee. So <laughs> if I get knocked down, I'm getting up. Well, anyway, you guys, I had a wonderful career. I I want to thank Muhammad Ali. Of course, it wasn't for him. I did, did a dream, come on, son. And I've been dreaming ever since. I want to thank my mama. Well, I, well, I believe I have some of my way because my mother is very funny, but she loves me. And my mother is my best friend. God bless her. Listen, I mean, well, anyway, she's still here, but God bless her. But she's a wonderful woman. She's a woman, you know what I mean? And I want to thank all my sisters and brothers because before I got into boxing, I had to fight for everything. <laughs> I had to fight to go to school. I was the one morning, somebody got my socks on, other one got my underwear on. I had to fight for everything. <laughs> so I truly believe the course of them, when I did start boxing, I pretty much had it down pat. <laughs> you know? So thank you guys so much. God bless you. Be good. Turn down any fans. 
and waits till the last person person gets a pic a signature or a picture. You know, sometimes we've sat down and I look at him and I think about what this man has done and who this man is. And ask him the same questions about his career and his life during the, during his career. Because I'm so fascinated by it all. And the celebrities that, are, that he made friends with and fans of him. Like Frank Sinatra, James Brown calling his name at a concert, and Magic Johnson telling me about stories about him and my dad. I'm blown, I'm blown away by it and ask myself, my father was that big. He touched these many people. And whether they were white, black, brown, red, green, it didn't matter. They were all touched and fascinated by Boom Boom. Pop, you are my hero. You're my idol. And you're man. You're man I strive to be every day. You go through what you go through what you have gone through in life, and I don't know how you're still standing here smiling, but I'm glad you are. It's an honor to have the same name and being your son. I can't tell you how proud I am of you. Every time I go on YouTube and watch your fights, I feel as if I'm there and get tired watching you do your thing. I hope you know how proud I am of you. It has Boom Boom, it has my father. And every time I leave for college and I see you for the last time till break, I want to cry like a baby and not let go of you when I say bye. Because you mean the world and more to me. And I hope I make you proud. I want to be his model and live with his great name. For I am this man's son and I'll never bear him shame. He's always been a positive influence in boxing by always helping out as much as possible. Whenever a young fighter needed advice, he would help them. When a fan ever wanted a picture, he would take it. Whenever, whenever a fan wanted an autograph, he would sign it. Anything for the fans. He told me as a kid, <coughs> quote, the reason I'm in the position I am in today is because of the fans. Without them, there's no me. End quote. And I've been, I've been around him more than anybody. And I have never seen him disappoint a fan. Not one. And I can give you a list of reasons why he's a great father. But I'll tell you this. He's always been there for us. Every practice, every game, every major event, he's there. Maybe a little too much, but hey, he's there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all a kid has for his father. I wasn't alive when he was fighting, but I seen every fight. And I seen the effect he has on people. And as a kid you don't really understand. But as you grow old as I grew older, I realized my dad was the man. And I just want to say I couldn't be more proud of my dad today. This honor has been a long time coming. And finally today boxing and ducks, not only a great fighter, but a great man. Thank you. When I talked to Ed Brophy the other day, I didn't know. I kind of I said that uh, like my kids should be between a couple, three or five minutes. He said, "Oh no, no, we got a guy who's going to introduce you." And Donald, Don, you're you must you're a lovely man, I'm sure. But I've known you for about ten minutes. You had no shot in Dr. me today. This <laughs> <laughs> is a one-shot deal, man. I mean, I'm gonna you know you got to give me a pass on this. 
So thank you for not that. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to kind of go down memory lane a little bit. I won't make it long. But there's, these are these times that you hear about you go with that people you want to thank in your life and those men. So I'm going to do that. We'll, we'll try to get through as fast as possible. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. Ah, thank you. I appreciate it. You know, I'm listening to all these, my, my children, and I'm hearing all the comments from people up here today. And I'm sitting here thinking some of my, my heroes, my, my boxing heroes. Now, I'm in the home of Carmen Basilio, one of my boxing heroes. Absolutely. Guys, two favorite guys to watch was Roberto Ben and Carlos Palomino. I mean, so I mean, Carlos is here today, and I'm, I'm with him. Not only I'm with him, I'm friends with him, and it, it's it's truly something. And I remember watching the Furious Eagle. I mean, reading about him, not watching. It's just to read about. I used to read the ring magazines and hear about Eagle Bushigan and what a great fighter he was. So I, I'm to be honored and be affected with him at the same time. And of course, Big Daddy, Big Daddy Bo. Of course, in my you know. To be heavyweight champ, well, that's it. Boxing goes as the heavyweights go. He, he was the king. And then, of course, Prince Nassim. You know, and I, I didn't realize he defended his title 16 times. Jimmy, 16 times. That's incredible. So, people like you, people like Max, and all those people at Harold, you, you make us guys bigger than we are. So, I always appreciate you guys, what you do. Um, I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there thinking, man, this ain't bad for a kid from the south side of Youngstown, Ohio. This ain't bad at all. <laughs> yeah. um, let, let me just say this. Everything I am and everything I've ever been and everything I ever will be is because of two reasons. And that's my family and my city of Youngstown, Ohio. I am a product of that city. I love my city, I love the people, they, they carried me a lot farther than I wanted to go at times, believe me. They were there for every fight, they supported me through my amateur career, through my professional career, and those people are the reason I am where I am today, there's no doubt. You know, Youngstown, we're known for many things in my hometown of Youngstown, one of them being fighters. And um, all 30 years, there's so many great fighters, so I certainly want to acknowledge them because they have a big part of who I am also. I'm a big part of his, uh, I'm a big fan of history. You know, world history, uh, American history, but also local history. And I'd sit there and I'd talk to my father and I'd ask him questions about the fighters from Youngstown, Ohio. He used to tell me about them. The guy, Jack Trammell. Jack Trammell was the number three heavyweight in the Joe Lewis. Never got the shot. Uh, my father, you know, my, I, these are people that hopefully one day in old timers category, they'll be here because of what they've accomplished. My father, he was everything I ever wanted to be. He was everything I wanted to be as a man, as a person, as a father. I, I, I listened to him and the stories he tell me. Tell me a story about Tommy Bell, who Ray Robinson, fought for Ray Robinson for the World Worldweight title. Of course, Tony Gennaro and uh, Joey Red the model the great fighters of Youngstown that helped make Youngstown what it is. And along those lines, I want to thank my contemporaries, the guys that I fought with in the amateurs. You know, we're Youngstown, we're the only city of our size to have five world champions from 1982. I was the first. <coughs> We've had four since. And I want to uh, congratulate and, and thank my contemporaries, guys who I fought with in the amateurs, went on the rule of titles. And that's Harry Arroyo, Greg Richardson and Jeff Lampkin. And uh, we, we've, we think we were on the same amateur team together. That's pretty significant, that's pretty strong. I want to thank my amateur trainer, Ed Sullivan. Ed Sullivan was a man who was, came like a second father. Ed Sullivan, when I went to his gym, I was 15 years old, I said, Mr. Sullivan, someday I'm going to be the best fighter you ever had. And instead of pushing me to the side, like I didn't, you know, I was a crazy young kid. He, he encouraged me and he nurtured me. And he said, young man, if you keep training and you work hard, you can be that. I want to thank my first amateur tournament 
guys, uh, I was, I was a, good, a bunch of a guy and trainers that took me to were very close to my family, very close friends of ours. And my trainer, Selvin, Selvin couldn't take me. So Mo Harvey, Joey Salcone, and Jimmy Saunders, they took me to my first amateur tournament and they were with me for my first six fights. So I love these guys. They're all along with us, but I love them to deep in my heart. I want to thank my professional trainer, Murphy Griffith. Murphy Griffith saw me in the 1979 Golden Gloves. He called my eventual manager, David Wolf. Dave had sent him down to look for the best pro prospect. And Griffith called Dave afterwards and said, I found it. I guess it was, I found a young Rocky Marciano. Um, after I lost my last amateur fight, Griff came into the training room and the dress room and said, young man, what's your plans? I said, I'm, I'm heart, you know, I was heartbroken. I said, I don't want to have another amateur fight. He said, young man, you're never going to win a national tournament. You could be a very good, very good pro. And um, he introduced me to David Wolf. David Wolf uh, came to Youngstown, Ohio, and he just convinced me. He said, look, and I had local guys in Youngstown wanting to handle me. But Dave Wolf said, I'm not going to offer you anything. I'm not going to give you no, fruit, no, no money. And he said, I'm just telling you this. You come to New York, you're going to sleep on Griff's couch, you're going to train it. You're going to go to the train to Main, uh, Times Square gym. He said, but young man, you do your job and I'll do mine. I'll get you to a real title. And that's all I want to hear. He did. He did. You know, they, Murphy Griffith is uh, from the Virgin Islands. He was the uncle of a Mill Griffith. And Dave Wolf was a, a, a New York Jew from up, 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 uh, Upper East Side. So I had a, you had a Italian kid from Youngstown, you had a New York Jew and a black guy from, from the from Virgin Islands. Man, I was the first, I was the Rainbow Coalition before Jesse. <laughs> before Jesse. <laughs> but I love, I love Murphy Griffith. I love them, man, as much as I could love anybody. And I'll never forget Griffith tell me, when I would, we had eat, would be eating early in my career, after a few, I had about four or five fights, six fights, he said to me, Ray, you're going to be my first world champion. You're going to be my first. And he believed it, it didn't belong to Friday. I mean, I don't believe I could do it, but he believed it right from the jump, right from the start. And Dave Wolf, he just, he just told me, he said, you keep doing your job. He says, we're going to get there. And I just love them guys, and I think about how from Griffith telling me you're going to be my first world champion, and I was. So I was very happy, very happy to give Dave and Griff their champion. I want to thank two other guys on my team from my hometown of Youngstown, Ohio, Chuck Fagan and Tank DeCicio. Chuck uh, <coughs> came on during my career, was helping out when I had local promotions, was helping Dave sell tickets and sell tickets out of the trunk of his car. And, Later on, he joined our team and traveled and became my, uh, my right hand, my right hand. And then Tank issue I grew up with, and eventually he joined our team. And they would live with me in training camp for every fight, and they believed in me a lot more than I believed in myself sometimes. And I just want to say thank you to them, for I love them, and I love them as if they were my own blood brothers. I want to thank all my opponents, because every fight was a step to getting here. So I thank all my opponents for helping me get along the way to get here. I want to thank all my promoters, whoever gave me a shot. Thank you for that. And uh, again, I want to thank the people of Youngstown for, for carrying me along the way. I want to thank a special person in my life from Youngstown, Father Tim O'Neill, who was my 10th grade religion teacher in school, and then became a fan, and he was following my fights, and then became, I, I call him my personal, my personal chaplain. He was like my person, every ring, every fight, he was in the dressing room with me, give me a final blessing before I go out there. And uh, I love that man, and then he's, no, he's not able to be here today, but I want to thank him for all the blessings he gave me. And, uh, and finally, and finally, I just want to thank my parents for who they are, my parents, my, my mother and father, they, they, they let, made me believe I could be whatever I wanted to be. My father said, Raymond, I love you just because. You're my baby. Just because you're my baby. And my mother said, you could be anything you want to be in this life. But the only thing, only, the only restrictions are those you put on yourself. And they encouraged me, they supported me, and they were there for everything. And I, I miss it. Though they've been taken from me, I, they're with me every day. They're with me every day, and I love them very much. I want to thank um, my brother, 
Again, who's taken from me long, too soon? My brother uh, in the gym, he, he was an amateur fighter with me, and we had wars in the gym. And he made me know that <laughs> I could be a pretty good fighter. He helped me become that guy. And um, every fight, he was the first one jumping in the ring to give me a hug, <laughs> some kisses. And long after, and even when he was gone, I, I'd be looking for him. But I know he's with every day, he's with me, he's in my heart. Every day, I still have him. So I want to thank him. I want to thank, thank my sister. My sister's here today. My sister, I'm like a second mother. But it's not like I'm a second mother. She's become like my best friend, a confidant, my consigliere. She's everything I've ever needed. When I need to talk, she's been in the ear for me. And she support, when, I went to, when I was a little league baseball, football, basketball, she's always been there watching me, supporting me. Uh, I love you so much. Thank you. You know, about nine years ago, I was uh, in a dark place in my life. And uh, every, every so often, you meet a person who kind of makes the world right again, who makes things right. And uh, I met a woman who just showed me how to love again. My wife, Tina, who I love. to my babies. I have my, my oldest is my daughter Nina who can't be here today. I, mean, I know she's with me in spirit. She's not here today. She wasn't able to make the trip. But um, my two boys, you know, they father couldn't ask for better boys. Couldn't ask for better sons. So I thank them. I thank God for them. And um, I just say, I accept this today, this award, on behalf of my father and my mother. But to, to you know, I accept this on behalf of all the Hall of Fame and all you guys here. And I certainly appreciate you allowing me to be standing here. But tomorrow, tomorrow, this will be my, my children. This will be my boys. They'll be theirs. And every day after, they'll be theirs. I'll be doing, I'll hold it for a while. I'll be wearing it for a while, but it's theirs. And I, wanted to, I want them to know, I accept it on their behalf because I want it to be a reminder to them, to remind them to, them to dream, and dream big, dream bigger than life. To remember to chase those dreams and to realize that dreams can and do come true. I'm living proof of that. Thank you so much, God bless you.